16 years, with apologies to any 16-year-olds in the audience, is not a lifetime. But it is long enough that if someone challenges a belief that you have known to be true for that length of time, it can be very difficult to shift your thinking. In 1996, we had our first child, a girl. She was a beautiful baby and a delightful toddler. Four and a half years later, we had our second. It's a boy, the doctor said. I have a son, said his dad. He is almost as pretty as I am, said his sister. <laughs> and he was, by all accounts, a typical boy. He loved trucks and baseball and Batman and Legos. So when, on the eve of his 16th birthday, he told me he was a girl, the struggle to wrap my head around that was enormous. What would you have called me if I'd been identified correctly as a girl, he asked. Sophia, after your great-grandmother. I want to be Sophia, he said. And Sophia she is, but Sophie for everyday use. I won't use male pronouns for her again. It's part of respecting who she is. What she didn't want was for me to tell anyone else. I went about four months as the only one in the house who knew. I would whisper her new name as we said goodnight, and I changed her contact information in my phone, and I cried a lot in the shower. I don't know how many times I repeated her new name, or how often I said to myself, my child is a girl. My child is a girl. I really didn't know what to think. I mean, I read the papers and I watch the news. The focus is on the extremes. Leela Alcorn walked into traffic on I-71 because her family wanted her to go through conversion therapy. On the other hand, I saw a talk show that featured these really happy, really binary-looking trans kids. Binary meaning that all of the boys looked like boys and all of the girls looked like girls. And they were great, and their families were great, and their lives were great, and things were not that great at my house. Not that anyone was getting kicked out. It made me so mad when Sophie said she was scared that might happen. I was like, do you know me? Have you lived in my house for 16 years? Sophie figured out she was staying, and she found the courage to tell her dad and her sister. Her sister is away at college, so that dynamic is not part of our everyday lives. Her dad, though, he took some convincing. I just don't see it, he kept saying. And I could see where he was coming from. She hadn't changed her appearance at all. She was the same cargo short-wearing, skateboarding, grubby kid we had always known. We had some pretty quiet family dinners. And we had family therapy. I highly recommend family therapy. It gives everyone a safe place to talk. It was in family therapy that we convinced Sophie that being transgender was not going to get her kicked out of our house. And family therapy was where she was able to explain to her dad just how much agony her body causes her every single day. Once Dad understood that, he was on board and ready to help Sophie be Sophie. We knew we needed to tell our families, but the summer slipped by without any progress. Sophie gave us a deadline by putting her new name in a community theater program. So we sat down one night and made a list, split it up, got to work. Sophie and her dad went to tell his mom. I kind of wish I'd been a fly on the wall for that. <laughs> My mom had been a therapist, an art therapist in her professional life, and I knew that she would be accepting. My dad has dementia, and there's really no reason to tell him anything new. But he seems to know that Sophie belongs to him, and they can both laugh when he offers to cut her hair almost every time he sees her. <laughs> I told my friends and my brothers and a few co-workers as word spread, I was pleasantly surprised at the acceptance I encountered 
If there is anyone who has turned away from me because of this, I don't miss them enough to know who they are. As a mom, I like to think of myself as a submarine mom. That would be the opposite of the helicopter moms. <laughs> We hear so much about them, but I want to go mostly undetected in my children's lives. <laughs> However, like any good submarine, I can come to the surface and, <laughs> and unleash holy hell, if necessary. <laughs> Sophie had an encounter with a substitute teacher Let's call him Tristan. Tristan knew Sophie because they'd worked on a project together, but he'd never seen her name on the roster. So when he called the role and Sophie answered to her birth name, Tristan went a little crazy. He accused Sophie of lying to him and he repeated her birth name over and over. I wasn't there, but the story I heard included the phrase transphobic jackass being dropped in the hallway. The call to come to a meeting at school was not unexpected. <laughs> My brother asked if I thought she might get suspended. Well, not until right now. <laughs> I think she deserves an apology, and if she doesn't get one, submarine mom may have to come to the surface. We met with Tristan and the teacher responsible for him. I gave him some reading materials, and we talked about dead naming. Dead naming is the use of a person's birth name when you've been asked to use a chosen one. Tristan was unfamiliar with the term and unaware of the damage it can cause. In the end, Sophie got her apology, Tristan got an education, and the teacher let Sophie know that she is an ally. I think when Sophie tells this story, I get a much more heroic role perhaps even some warheads being launched. <laughs> but I think we managed it pretty well. The run-in with Tristan made me realize that we needed to make Sophie's name change official. That's been in the news a lot lately, but for us, after a few false starts, the process was pretty straightforward. Sophie's a minor, so I had to file a petition in the probate court. We waited the required 30 days, and then we all had to appear in front of the magistrate. He asked Sophie why she wanted to change her name. And she said, so it will match my gender identity. And he granted the order just like that. Submarine mom only started to surface when we had to wait an additional 30 days because of a filing error. And then the paperwork still wasn't ready. The hot tears I tried to hide in the hallway of the probate court were half frustration and half mourning the loss of that name that we had given her. One place I knew I had to fix her name even before it was official was on her Christmas stocking. I had cross-stitched it for her the year she was born and I wanted to make it right for Christmas Eve. So late at night, I had to take it apart and pick out the letters of her birth name and then chart and stitch in her new name. The process was cathartic, and on Christmas Eve, I was ready for the joy, the accolades, maybe even a Mother of the Year <laughs> nomination. I got, oh, thanks. I hadn't thought about my stocking. <laughs> there were some tears in the shower that night. But Sophie and I talked about it recently, and she said she really was happy that I fixed it and that she told all of her friends. And in retrospect, it seems like a pretty typical mother-teenager interaction. Another pretty typical thing is shopping, right? Shopping with your daughter should be fun. <laughs> Moms, okay. Shopping with somebody whose body causes them distress, for whom the very act of dressing and undressing can be traumatic, and then there are gendered dressing rooms. So we were out for one of Sophie's first shopping trips for clothes to match identity. I had suggested that capris might appear more feminine than the cargo shorts. 
she'd found some things and we were headed back to change, I realized that she'd never had this experience, so I grabbed a top. I have one, I said, and I don't know how many she ended up with. The lady gave us our numbers and we went back to try things on. Why numbers, Sophie asked. I said, well, if you go in with eight items, you should come out with eight items. She gets it now, and I've learned to keep our shopping trips short and sweet. So with bits and pieces of a new wardrobe and paperwork to back you up, you can go a long way to making your identification match your identity. Um, first step, driver's license, done. Social security card, done. We've changed her birth certificate, but Ohio is one of only three states where you cannot change your gender marker on your birth certificate, so Sophie will have to register with the selective service. She's changed her bank account and her registration at school. She still has some things to do, but she is well on her way to having all of her identification match her identity. We shared a lot of smiles and high fives through that whole process. Having that identification gave her the confidence to apply for a job, and she's been working at a local restaurant. We all went in for breakfast, and it was really fun to see her in that setting, just doing her job and joking with her coworkers. She brings home great stories, and dinnertime conversations are lively again. So what have I learned? We have to be educated. Read, watch, listen. You may encounter information that makes you uncomfortable, but I survived, and so will you. We have to be kind. If a friend or family member comes out to you, just listen and accept. Make sure that your house is a safe place for your kids and their friends. We have to be aware names and pronouns can make or break a transgender person's day. Respect the name you're asked to use. I've learned to use they as a singular pronoun. I don't love it grammatically, <laughs> but I think it's a small concession for another person's happiness. We have to be real and ask questions, but this is tricky because there are a whole bunch of questions we do not get to ask. No genitalia questions, no surgery questions, no what's your real name questions, and no do you think you might ever change back questions. But if you ask the questions you'd ask anyone else, maybe someday you'll get to hear the stories that answer the questions you think you want to ask. And best of all, you will never have to encounter a submarine mom coming to the surface. Yeah.